We're going to talk about expedition medicine. I always tell this story, and if you've heard me speak before, this, you're going to say, ah, I've heard this story, but I can't give this talk without it. And it's simply to tell you that the first time I went on a big expedition was the expedition that Eric talked about, Chimichanga. Um, and, and it was to climb the third highest mountain in the world, Kanchenchunga. And uh, I knew nothing about big time expedition medicine. I'd been doing wilderness medicine. I'd been a guide for many years. I'd supported a lot of one to two week trips and Grand Canyon trips. But I'd never gone to a big mountain. Three months, uh, 15 days from the trailhead, and here I am. So I called Peter Hackett, who's one of my mentors at this meeting. I said, Peter, how much IV fluid should I take um, on Conchinchunga? And Peter, you know Peter, you've heard him speak by now. He's very cool. In fact, listen to him sometime. I only noticed this recently. He doesn't look anything like George Clooney, but he sounds like George Clooney. And uh, I said, Peter, how much IV fluid should I take on Conchinchunga? And he goes, well, Howard, you know, just take whatever you think you need. And uh, <laughs> so I, I called Eric and said, Eric, I'm going to Conchinchunga. How much IV fluid should I take? And uh, Eric said, you know, you should call Hackett. And uh, I, called, um, I called Gil Roberts, who was the doctor uh, on the first successful American Everest expedition in 1963. And I knew Gil. Gil's since passed away, but I knew Gil back in those days. He was another one of my mentors, kind of a nihilist, I must admit. And I said, Gil, uh, I'm going to Conchinchunga. It's Howard Donner. And how much IV fluid should I take? And he literally goes, well, Howard, you know, it doesn't really matter what you bring. Anybody that's going to live is going to live, and anybody that's going to die is going to die. <laughs> so I ended up bringing six liters. My thinking, OK, so I've got somebody with some kind of moderate medical illness, moderate non-surgical trauma. I've got six liters of normal saline. I don't know. That's what I brought. And we ended up using none of it. But I started working for NASA right after I came back from that trip. And they were putting together, in those days, the International Space Station before it flew. And I was involved in putting together the medical system. And they called me up in front of a room like this with distinguished scientists from all over the world, and most of these people, aerospace doctors. I was their wilderness medicine guy. And um, they said, Dr. Donner, as you know, we have the capability on board Space Station to produce our own IV fluids via ultrafiltration. But what we'd like to know from you, since it takes some time to produce these fluids, how much IV fluid should we have on board space station? <laughs> I just remember going up to the microphone, kind of, uh, six, six liters. <laughs> I don't know. So, so the reason I tell this story and the reason I think it's pertinent isn't because I'm just trying to be flip about this, but because it's so hard to predict what you're going to need on an expedition. You can't carry a hospital formulary in your pack, and it's funny. I give this talk at meetings oftentimes, and you know I'll talk about uh, things like pain medicine. We'll hopefully have time to talk about this at some point. And there's oftentimes an angry-looking anesthesiologist you know, at the bottom of the podium. And I encourage you to come up. I like it. But they have this kind of body language. And I'll go, hey. And they'll go, hi. I'll go, what's up? And they'll go, well, I'm just kind of surprised you just mentioned bringing morphine as your you know, narcotic analgesic. I mean, really, you need to have some fentanyl and some ketamine, and they go on and on. And I'll go, you know, are you an anesthesiologist? And I'll go, yeah, why? And at some point, we have to get used to the idea that you can't carry an entire <laughs> milk of amnesia. Um, you can't carry an entire hospital formulary in your pack. So um, this is not the environment we're talking about. This is the most sophisticated wilderness medicine environment I've ever worked in. That was the medical tent on Denali at 14,000 feet. And this is what happens when you carry too much. You just can't bring everything. I, I haven't showed this picture before, but this is a picture that Eric asked me not to show. But um, Stanford was asked to put together an expedition kit for a recent cruise. And this is what they ended up with. <laughs> this is uh, Eric's new Stanford-based wilderness medicine rescue system. I don't know, I don't know how that's working. But if, if you have the option to bring all sorts of stuff in, uh, obviously, it, it changes everything. And in that big wilderness medicine book out there, which is a great book, you know, sort of the Bible of wilderness medicine, there used to be a chapter by a PharmD, and it was a well-written chapter by a smart guy. 
but there was this algorithm, and it basically suggested how much you need to bring. So you've got 14 Boy Scouts, or 14 humans, basically, and you're out for five days, so you need to bring 143 ibuprofen. And it never made sense to me, because ultimately, it depends on so many variables. What are the pre-existing medical conditions of your group? Are you a doctor? Are you a surgeon? Are you a first aider, first responder, woofer? What kind of equipment do you have? What are the endemic diseases of the area you're going to? Are you going into the tropics, the desert? Are you a cell phone call away from being on a, a helicopter like you are on Mont Blanc, where if you have a hangnail, you call for rescue and you're in a hospital in Chamonix in eight minutes? Or are you in the Brooks Range in Alaska or the Bugaboos or someplace where there is no helicopter rescue and no cell phone coverage? It goes on and on and on and on. So there's no way that I can tell you what to bring on a trip. Ultimately, I think it's largely a gestalt based on so many variables that we won't even go into them. I'm not going to tell this story. I often show Denali pictures just to get people cold. It's a great place to see what happens to people when they're in cold environments. See major trauma up there. And as we said, that's not the operating environment. This is sick patients with all sorts of injuries. Um, including fractures, hypothermia, unstable C-spines. This is uh, flying that gentleman out in the Llama, the most, one of the most capable high-altitude aircraft on Earth. This is the Llama we used on Denali, so of course we called it the Denali Llama. <laughs> this is a uh, PJ that helped us with our evacuations out of 7,000. Um, we'd fly these guys down to 7,000 and then jump in a Black Hawk. This was problematic because his comm system and my Park Service helmet didn't work together. So we were screaming at each other. And in the middle of this patient rescue, he noticed that I was wearing his boots. And that didn't go over well. Um, won't talk about the injuries right now. Hemo, pneumo, fracture. Um, this is a picture I took of this ranger. She had skinny legs and was wearing these Mickey Mouse boots. And I, I thought it looked funny. Here is a picture of one of the iterations of the ISS, uh, the International Space Station Medical System, we'll be talking about a kit kind of like this. These are these pallets that open out of these subsystems, and it's basically the same stuff that we'll be talking about today. Eric asked me to uh, bring this up to date, so I, I put in a little bit of, uh, we're going to talk a lot about the Star Trek system today. Um, this is the SOMES, or Shuttle Orbiter Medical System kit. Um, and uh, there are two, basically, medical kits that look about like this. Eric warned me that when I went to the Himalayas, uh, you need to be careful because well-meaning expeditions from all over the world often dump medicines at your doorstep. Um, Eric will talk about this, too. Stuff that I don't use a lot of in my practice. I, I don't usually use streptomagma, for example. And I asked Eric how he deals with it. And he said, what he has learned is if you just feed the stuff to the yaks, you typify the medicines based on their reaction. <laughs> so how much are we going to bring? This is where I was about a week and a half ago. There's a place called Torres del Paine in southern Chile. Um, we're talking about putting into a kit like this. Well, you probably learned in medical school, I did, that doctors lie. And uh, I hate to say this, but the physical examination that we learned how to do in medical school, if you actually tried to do that physical exam on a patient, you would see between one to two patients a day. So it's the same thing for medical kits. You know, people, you know, what was I carrying when I was running around in southern Chile last week? I wasn't carrying half the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. I had a SAM splint, some duct tape, um, some ibuprofen, and maybe an ACE wrap. So uh, why an ACE wrap? Because it helps for putting on splints. You can't stabilize a blown-out joint with an ACE wrap, but you can, co you can provide compression. So remember, the treatment for sprains, of course, is rice. You can't really elevate rest or ice while you're walking out on a sprained ankle, but you can compress. And if you learn how to tape an ankle, either with adhesive tape or with duct tape, uh, an ACE wrap really helps hold that on. Sometimes doctors come back from trips and they say, you know, it wasn't as cool as the slideshows. You know, your slideshows seem exciting, and you know, really I was just handing out a lot of Band-Aids. It helps to give your group a list of items that you want them to carry. If you're lazy, and it's not just lazy, it's every time people are rummaging through your medical kit to get to the Band-Aids and the blister stuff, it sort of plays havoc with the kit. So I like to make a list. 
whatever you like, lip stuff, blister stuff, band-aids, whatever, uh, so that people aren't coming up to you every minute asking for ibuprofen. I have limited time today, but I'm going to tell this story because it's a fun one. Um, just the frustrations, the first time I went to the Himalayas working for the Himalayan Rescue Association, we had this interpreter in the upper right, this patient in the lower left who was Tibetan. I was working in this town called Manong. Some, some of you have probably trekked through there near the Annapurnas. And our interpreter spoke English and Nepali. Then we had to have a Nepali to Manongba, which is the local dialect of the Manong people. And then we had to have a third translator that went from Manongba to Tibetan and then to the patient. So I remember saying at some point about there, Asok, ask him if it hurts when he urinates, when he pees. And uh, so Asok asked the uh, Manongba Nepali interpreter who went to the Tibetan Manongba interpreter who went to the patient, started going back and forth. And pretty soon, all the interpreters were arguing. Ah, da, 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 da. And the family was chiming in. The patient was shaking his head. And yes, and everyone was talking. And literally after about 40 seconds, I just said, Asok, what are they saying? And he goes, no. <laughs> so it's uh, truly lost in translation.